the question that's implicit there is, does history help? And the reason that we're going to look at it is because we're asking that question from your point of view, given the things that you're doing on your courses and also doing in BMC. It's a perfectly reasonable question. Sometimes people have said to me, um, why, why, don't we, why don't we study history? Because we're going into the modern world, we don't need to know about all of that, it's in the past, it's gone. It's the great thing about it. Um, this, I hope, will provide just some insights into the way in which history can help you, both in terms of just information, but also in terms of techniques of thinking about how the world works, because that stuff applies today. So I've tried to make this a little more, a little sharper. To what extent can an understanding of the historical context after which objects emerge help us? And then I've just set myself three tasks. I could have chosen other ones, but these are the three that I've chosen. Identify things accurately, so just name stuff. Um, identify the motivations of the designers who brought those objects into being. Quite often we come across the images of things and do we know what they thought they were doing at the time that they brought that thing into the world? I'm going to show a, a suggestion, an, an example which may suggest that we don't. And then this third one, I think is, is probably the major one. Because you've lived long enough to notice that the designs of objects, types of objects, change over time. Sometimes they're sort of technological innovations, but there's also stylistic changes. And the fundamental question that in our work we keep coming back to is, why do they change? And it's not just why do they change, but why do they change from that into that? And sometimes it's quite difficult to work it out, but I absolutely believe None of the changes that happen in art, in design, none of them happen for no reason at all. And sometimes I've heard people answer the question, you know, why does it change? And the answer comes back, oh, fashion. This is not an answer. Fashion is another name for change. It's, it's, it's saying, yeah, look, we are seeing now that's fashionable, now this is fashionable. The question still remains, why? And why like that? So, finally, understand retro and vintage, which I thought might be useful. So, identify things accurately. I, I, I thought I'd start with an obvious example. Here we have a picture of, uh, self-evidently, um, a teapot. And we know it looks like a teapot. It comes from the B&A, and in its catalogue, it says, it is a punch pot. Um, and what it was, was it was there for serving hot, spiced wine. It just happens to have the same shape. Now, I'm keenly aware of this kind of, of mismatch between things, because while I was at the b &A doing my master's course, I analysed what had been labelled um, a watering pot. And I'd gone watering pot, watering can, it was a ceramic thing. And I'd so assumed it was something to do with gardening, and did all my research on that object, researching into gardening, looking for earthenware, watering pots. And I have subsequently learned that this watering pot was in fact designed to keep rushes down on the floor inside um, homes. It was nothing to do with gardening at all. So sometimes actually correctly identifying something can be important. Now, identify the motivations of the designers who brought those objects into being. I thought we'd look at something that we've probably all seen. We probably even might have a name for it. And it's this cheap. 
Odessa is an industrial town. So the Bauhaus itself is changing in terms of its aspirations. Um, we can see some of that in the way in which they are designing. And we can see Breuer doing something clever in front of the camera. There is the building at Odessa. It is built as a sort of ideal factory. The detailing of this building, the plan of it, the layout of it, is completely taken from the car factories that were emerging in Detroit about 10 years earlier. And the thing with the car factories is that you have a conveyor belt, you have an assembly line, and it moves along, you put bits on the car, put bits on the car, put bits on the car, and in order for the assembly line to be lit, you have to have glazing that runs the entire length of the building to let the sunlight in. That's why so much modern architecture has horizontal strip windows. It comes from the factory. They don't have an assembly line in there, but they admire mass production hugely. They've got actually in there some very, very well-equipped craft workshops. Let's do that. The Bauhaus, by this stage, because there is a possibility of manufacture, the Bauhaus has this very strong moral obligation to the world. What they want to do, and you must remember there's a lot of poverty around at this time, the Bauhaus are not just saying, oh, we're going to make pretty things, we're going to do things like the Wiener Werkstätte. No, they've actually got um, a social conscience. And what they're doing is trying to develop the most beautiful things that you can for the least cost using machinery so that ordinary people can enjoy things as beautiful as anybody who's rich. This is a, a high social, moral ambition. And so when you see these, these examples here, um, they had a sort of four course, a foundation course, if you like, that's where our foundation course comes from. They're doing these exercises. Look at them very, very carefully. You could look at them and you could think, oh, they make really good greetings cards. Well, it's not about that. What they're trying to do is they're doing exercises to see if you can achieve something that is very beautiful, but with the minimum of means. So rather than sticking on, I don't know, some gold leaf or adding ornament or whatever, they've taken sheets of card very delicately, and those sheets of card have been cut by hand, but they could have been stamped out. So they're doing exercises to try and achieve that kind of ambition. Here we can see the insides of the workshops. Um, I believe that's a, it's not a metal working workshop, I think it's a print one. They have the craft workshops not to make craft objects, so not like the arts and crafts movement, to make prototypes to go into industrial production. That is the ideal. Because they want as many people as possible to have these beautiful things. This is the sort of thing they were producing in Weimar. This, so in the earlier stage, this um, uh, famous, yeah, it's one of the most famous images in design, I think. Um, and, and here we come to the business of what is it? When I was shown it when I was at school, Growing up, I was told it was a teapot, and I looked at it, and actually I was in the business of making teapots at the time. I could center around the clay, I could make a teapot. And I looked at it and I thought, that is the dumbest teapot I have ever seen. Because how on earth can you grab hold of the handle without it slipping out of your hand with the weight of water in there? I understood the engineering of teapots, and I despised this. Ha, 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 ha. It's not a teapot. It's not a punch pot either. Um, it's a tea infuser. It belongs to a completely different tradition of tea to our own um, teapot with the tea leaves and the boiling water. It belongs to a tradition, and you'll know it from Russian films, maybe, where they have a samovar with boiling water, and then they have a tiny sort of syrupy essence of tea, and you take your tea glass, none of this cup and saucer nonsense, you put a little bit of the essence in it, and then you top it up with boiling water. This um, tea infuser, it, it all came to me when I, I um, the, 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 the iron curtain fell, I got in my car, I drove to Weimar to go and have a look because I knew bits of Germany, I had no idea that Weimar was near the bit that I knew. And they had an exhibition about the Bauhaus and I saw these, and they're tiny. They're about the 
the size of your hand. Tiny, tiny little thing. The important thing about it is that it embodies geometry, platonic geometry. Why is that important? Because in the Bauhaus they thought that people were attracted to things, not because they grew up with this and they liked that, or if they grew up over here, they liked that. Not because of culture. That human beings, they believed, were drawn to a universal kind of aesthetic, an aesthetic that worked for every human being on the planet, and they believed it was rooted in geometry. From their point of view, this uh, geometry is a gift in terms of manufacture. Because, and this is their logic, making things using a machine, it's easier to make things using a machine if they are simple. universal geometry and it fits with your modern aspiration to use the machine to give the world beautiful objects. Now, the difficulty with this object is that it is a craft made object and it is wholly unsuited to industrial manufacture. But this is in the early stage. They are absolutely coming around to the idea that they need to be manufacturing. Um, Wilhelm Weidenfeld designed this lamp. He wanted it to be for industrial manufacture and he took it to uh, an industrial fair in Stuttgart in 1924, and he got it out of the box and he showed it to the manufacturers, and they laughed at him. They laughed at him because he didn't understand how machines worked. He didn't understand how factories worked. He didn't understand assembly lines. And although you can buy this still as an icon of the Bauhaus, Wagenfeld himself said, I look at it now and I can see that it is a lifeless, bloodless thing. They have a mission. We're looking at poverty, and yet we were thinking about a chair. That poverty was all too real. In the Germany of the 1920s, there were many local authorities who put public money into trying to replace this kind of housing and take the people from it and put them into this kind of housing, which they saw as their moral and social obligation. And you can see that the aesthetic of it is absolutely this aesthetic of the machine. It's modernity. It is, it is some exciting new world. And because space is at a premium, they set about redesigning everything to fit into small spaces. This is a very famous kitchen uh, designed by Margareta Schuteliotsky, 1927. It's your cabin kitchen. It's the forerunner of so many tiny, tiny kitchens that are fitted out very, very thoughtfully. So not the spacious kitchen with the pine table and the rest of it, but something very small um, and, and seen as a logical sort of workshop. The chair only makes sense in the context of designing for a small space. Because part of the logic is it, of it is that it is transparent. So you can take an English armchair and put it in a space and it immediately makes the room smaller. You can take the B3 and put it in a space and it doesn't. That was part of the aspiration behind it. There are problems with what happened in reality. What happened in reality was that the chair went into production. Actually, you don't need sophisticated machinery to make that chair. You need a few craft skills lined up one after another, a bit of pipe bending, the sort of thing any plumber could do. Um, nothing particularly sophisticated, so it's not really a high level machine object, although it has the aesthetic of it. And as you can see from this advertisement, this advertisement is not pitched at working class people. This advertisement is pitched at very <coughs> sophisticated um, and quite wealthy intellectual people in Germany in the 1930s. So in reality, the extent to which it gets realized as this gorgeous thing for ordinary people is pretty prescribed. But now we can see that this chair only makes sense in the form that it is because of the economics of the time, because of the politics, the left-wing politics of the time, because of the social conditions that were the background to it, and because of this belief in aesthetics and it's not just an accidental taste in certain things. It is a belief that 
some kind of aesthetics will be of social value.
mass of her shape is quite literal. You may, if you choose, lay your head here. Okay, here. Right. And I've got these childbearing hips. So marry me and you will have great sex and a man. Fabulous. Um, that obviously was the promise of the shape of this particular um, style. The thing that happens in between and that absolutely undercuts this model of a relationship with men is the First World War. One of the consequences, obviously, is that a lot of men go off to war. Another consequence is that women, because the men have gone, they get to run the buses beyond the trams. Um, they're sort of required um, to make munitions if they're working class or become. We had a look at this in the First World War um, uh, camp earlier. So women get lots of new roles, which doubtless invited them to question what it was appropriate for a woman to do. Now, we've seen that and we've got an idea. This is the thing you must always do. See if you can find a source to test it and a reliable source. I've done that here. I've got something from the National Archive. And it says, and it's important, the Representation Peoples Act, February 1918, this is the act that gave women the vote, um, was widely portrayed as a reward for the contribution of female labor to the war effort. However, while the act granted the vote to all men over 21, before that you had to own property before you could vote, um, subject to a six months residence qualification, only women over the age of 30 were given the same privilege, obviously, because you see younger women would be too stupid to know how to vote. That was the logic that was behind this, so it's obviously a marginal um, thing. Further proof of the limits of the wartime marginal sexual equality was provided by the post-war backlash against women's employment, in particular against the continued employment of married women. As soon as the conflict ended, the number of women working in munitions factories and transport fell away rapidly. Ex-servicemen reclaimed the jobs that had been performed by women during the previous four years. Moreover, even in long-standing bastions of female employment, such as laundry industry, women now found themselves in competition with disabled ex-servicemen. You can see that for the women of the post-World post -first World War period, um, their existence was somewhat tough. This is the clincher. I can't remember if I've told you about this part, which if I have, I apologize. Um, I used to be a Meals on Wheels driver, and I delivered meals to a lady called Miss Partridge. Um, and we got on, we joked. And when I stopped doing the Meals on Wheels stuff, I used to go around and sit, glue her chairs back together or whatever. And um, we chatted about things, and I asked her directly, um, why did you never marry? And she said, oh, Ray, um, they were all dead. There weren't any men to marry, so I looked after my brother, and I looked after my mother, and, and I've had a good life. And she was absolutely serious about this, because when she was just coming to marriageable age, 1918, 1919, the number of men that were around to marry had gone right down, because they died in the war or become disabled. So, she was growing up in a very, very difficult time. The women who were there, that model that applied with the Gibson girl, it was a hopeless model because there wouldn't necessarily be a man to marry. And the competition for the men who were still there was much keener. And so, the look, the fashionable look, see Louise Brooke there, becomes much more aggressive much more assertive and much more overtly sexual. Louise Brooke is not saying, marry me. She's saying, we're going to have a good time. That's what she's saying. It's about a different kind of transaction. So the idea of the woman is much more of a, a, a party animal, a flapper of the 1920s. And of course, all that stuff about giving birth to children or just you know some restful home company all gone, all gone. You could buy elasticated tubes that would make your boobs sit flat. You were supposed to be more like a man, more like a boy, actually. Um, that became the ideal. And of course, all that hair, the thing about hair is hair is touch me, feel me, touch me, feel me. Hair throughout history has been touch me, feel me. You take it off, you have it bobbed. You're like a boy. You are the equal of the man. That helps to account for those changes. Here's another one. And this one looks like it's so trivial, you'd think, oh, surely there's nothing particular going on there. And yet it involves a detail of fashion and another world war. 
decision to dress themselves in such a way that they're completely unfit for housework. They absolutely can't get in the kitchen and do that stuff because they are wearing these tottery heels and possibly they're going to have a life of glamour and possibly sex and possibly things that are more interesting than burning the beer or whatever it might be. So actually, this comparatively trivial detail on women's shoes over this period points to some big sociological changes that were happening at the time. Who'd have thought? Well, the person who wrote that article in that book thought, I can't remember her name at the moment, but it's very, very interesting. So, one final one. We'll have one for the boys now. Yes, cars, boys <laughs> get some cars in. See the car in 1947, see the car in 1958, you will notice there is a fin or there isn't a fin. So this is sort of another one of those, okay? And, yeah, there's a fin, there's not a fin. The important thing here is to notice that the bodies of American cars, long before that happened in Europe, um, American car bodies become, <coughs> instead of on the bottom, car body on the, on the left there, the body is there to keep the passengers dry and keep the rain off the motor. And the radiator at the front just sits there. And it's a radiator. It is a radiator. It does the job of cooling the water to cool the engine, and it sits there. The car on this side, it too has a radiator, but you can't see it. It's inside. What it's got is a fictional account of the radiator at the front. And notice how it sweeps down. So what we're starting to get here are car bodies that are interesting, attractive stories. Don't worry about the mechanics inside. That's not interesting. What's interesting is how exciting this car is. So that's not a real radiator. And once they'd started, they knew no limits. The young men, they were all men. The young men who designed American cars in the 1940s and 50s had been growing up in the 1920s and and the sort of stuff that captured the boy's imagination, apart from the obvious, but we'll get to the obvious in a minute, um, the sort of stuff that would capture a boy's imagination would be space travel and uh, all of this sort of stuff. And it has an aesthetic to it. It's streamlined. It's not necessarily scientific streamlining. It is exciting streamlining. It's about the future. So, sure enough, when the boys sit down, and in the department originally known as Art and Colour in General Motors, they fantasise about cars for the future. So this one by um, uh, a guy called Mitchell. Uh, cars have not yet been made in these shapes, but he's, he's making it more streamlined, more exciting. And, and you know, this radiator, it's, now, it's, it's, it's assumed some completely fictional thing. It's, 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 it's not about the radiator at all. And in order to do calculations about what innovation to, to, to bring out. General Motors, under this guy, Harley Earp, who could not draw, but could manage a design workshop, they would put together mock-ups of what they were thinking of doing. Dream cars. And they'd show them at car shows, and they'd take them to um, you know, society events, engage people's reactions. At the time when he was driving this 1938 Buick Perseva, there was nothing on the road that looked like it. Nothing that smooth, that glamorous. Um, this was an out of the world, out of this world object. And in that way, by gauging people's reactions, they didn't throw the switch on an assembly line and make a massive investment in something that bombed, in the English sense. Yeah, sex and violence. These are always attractive to men. Um, uh, some, uh, some kinds of sex. Um, so here we have uh, the violence side of it. America emerges out of the Second World War, the most powerful country in the world. And a lot of that might has been military might. Um, they, uh, they, they engage in the, the Korean War, um, so they, they see themselves as a military country. And while the war was going on, Harley Earl, because he was well connected to the country club, Harley Earl got taken to see America's secret weapon. And it was so secret, he wasn't even allowed to see it close up. He was just taken um, several hundred yards away from it in a hangar. And in the distance, he could see this Lockheed P-38. Lockheed P-38. The Lockheed P-38, he recognized immediately was a very exciting object. And he knew that he needed to take this, just, he just saw it briefly, but he knew that he had to take it and somehow work it into the design of cars. 
it's got pointy bits. And of course they call them Dagmars. They just call them Dagmars. They would give the god Dagmars. And but they look as if they are it's somehow in some fantasy way. It's like, you know, they're sort of like they're military. They're gonna shoot, they're gonna do something. And of course what they help do is compensate for all those feelings of impotence the car might so often have. Um, because General Motors doesn't just have the Ford, okay? General Motors has a whole range of different cars, from Cadillac at, uh, from um, Chevrolet at the bottom, with Cadillac at the top, and then um, Buick and others in between, okay? So you have different types of car for different types of market. The way in which you use the fin is to, in 1950, you buy a Chevrolet, no fin. Nope, you're denied fit. You buy a Cadillac, and you have this thing at the back. Obviously, it's there to stabilize the car. It's just there. It's just there to make it more exciting. And what they do is, over time, they introduce more and more of this military sort of glitter at the front. Um, and and the, this type of design makes its way into all sorts of, of, of um, branches of American design. So by the time you get to 1958, and of course other manufacturers got the wind of it and they started introducing fins too, by the time you get to 1958, the logic is absolutely ruthless. In order to attract the male buyer, and it is men you are selling to, you make the thing have massive fins and big pointy bits out the front. Um, and, and this is, you know, this is the this is the thing that says that you are powerful. You know, it compensates for. Um, and in this case, and, and you get it too, there's a kind of heraldry that goes with it. Um, uh, so it's giving it sort of a little bit of you know, historical antecedents. But the point about it is that it works. In that time and place, it works. Europeans looked at it and they went, oh, how can you do that? It's so vulgar. And they did nice you know, citron and things and didn't do stuff like that at all. But it worked in the context of the time and place. Here we see them growing, 1948, 1949, 1951, 1954, and there they are. So, I would argue that historical context helps explain fins on cars in America in that time. In conclusion, to what extent can an understanding of the historical context out of which objects emerge help us? Oh, I understand retro and vintage. Sorry, I forgot about retro and vintage. How are we doing for time? Do you know? I'm skipping it. I'm skipping it. Um, it's good, I've got the slides up there. Uh, yeah, because um, we've run out of time. It's really interesting. The thing about the retro and vintage one was that I make a comparison with the 1960s, and yes, you can see that we're doing retro and vintage for slightly parallel reasons, but there are limits on it. The wider point that I want to make is that these historical examples, it's not just that they're interesting in themselves, although I think they are, they help us to understand how design operates today, not in the particular details of the thing, but unless we understand how men and women relate to one another, how our attitudes towards technology are, um, the ideas that are big in our world, we can't make sense of that world, we can't make sense of the design and architecture, the fashion in that world, the advertising, 